Welcome to Chapter 9. I'm Mr. Rodman taking you through campaigns and elections. Thanks for joining me. Let's start with a couple of review concepts. And uh, before I do, I will mention uh, from time to time some other resources that I think you'll find helpful. One of them we see here is five things you need to know about the Electoral College. It is on my YouTube channel. Uh, I'll, I will also post it on my um, Google Classroom, but uh, I think you'll find it helpful if you need a little more information about the Electoral College uh, in terms of the, the nuts and bolts. I think that will that will help you. Um, term limits. We don't have any term limits for House members or senators, but we do have term limits for the President. The 22nd Amendment saw to that. Uh, the idea that the President can serve two full four-year terms or 10 years, whichever comes first. Uh, remember, uh, once a member has either lost re-election or um, is term limited, then they are what we call a lame duck. Uh, so they are serving out the remainder of their term, uh, but they're not, not running again or won't be serving in office again. Therefore, they're called the lame duck. Uh, winner take all, the idea in the Electoral College, another concept that's important. Uh, if you win the most votes uh, of anyone in that state, you win that state. Uh, so if there is a plurality, there's three people running instead of two uh, from the, the major political parties. Uh, if you win the most votes, of that state, you win that state. And remember, the magic number of the Electoral College is 270, just like the interstate outside WJ. Uh, the idea is it, it, to get to uh, Washington, to get to the White House, you got to take Interstate 270 to get there. And 270 is the number of electoral votes you need in order to make that happen. Now, are there faithless electors from time to time? There are people who decide not to vote the way their state has uh, told them to by popular vote. But uh, those faithless electors sometimes will do that and based on their um, the fact that the majority votes and uh, moves in that direction. Um, but uh, those you tend to be the outliers, uh, the exceptions, not the rule. There is incumbency advantage in the House and Senate. Those that uh, were incumbents or are incumbents and run do have a better shot at winning always. Um, in the House, particularly, we see a lot of safe seats. Gerrymanderings made that possible. Go back and uh, look at the uh, concepts in Chapter 11 related to gerrymandering and the safe seats. Uh, but the approach there is that many House members uh, run for re-election and win pretty handily as a result of their, their work there. Now, midterm elections, uh, those are the ones in between presidentials. Uh, so in 2020, we uh, we have a general election that is a presidential election. 2018 was a midterm. 2022 will also be a midterm election uh, in that capacity. Pork barrel spending. Don't forget, uh, bring home the bacon for your district uh, is, is the way you want to remember that. Um, the more spending you bring home, the more you show people back home in your district how you have been successful in uh, helping them win contracts and create jobs, uh, the more likely you are to be reelected. Uh, and that's an important point. Now, primary elections tend to have a lot of people from your party. Uh, hopefully, if you're a um, if you're a popular elected official in your district, uh, you probably have fewer people running against you in the primary. If you're unpopular, you would have a lot more people running. And a lot of times there's some grassroots campaigns out there, people who are running uh, in order to um, to generate uh, uh, enthusiasm among uh, the uh, the supporters back home. Um, and they, we, we see a lot of those from time to time that crop up. Um, it's hard to run a grassroots campaign without money, but it is possible to do, and um, and and gerrymandering is sought to that uh, because uh, if the uh, districts are gerrymandered, as you see in the Maryland congressional race races here, um, the Supreme Court not stepping in on a lot of those, uh, but the gerrymandering definitely having an impact. We saw that in North Carolina, we saw that in Wisconsin, we saw that in Maryland, and in a number of places, Supreme Court not stepping in. They're pretty much saying, "Hey, uh, that's a that's a political issue." Uh, not a judicial one. Uh, we we solve constitutional problems, not political ones, and um, that that's something that that uh, elections have consequences over. So very important to um, to have that done at the um, legislative level and work that out.
amongst yourselves. Superdelegates, uh, we see that with the uh, primaries uh, held in the Democratic races uh, for president. Superdelegates being those elected officials or former elected officials and celebrities uh, that come to the convention will vote. And this was set up as a result of the McGovern Fraser Commission we talked about in the last chapter, in Chapter 7, uh, looking at the, uh, the idea of how do we broaden the tent uh, so that we can appeal more to the people that are working at the polls and getting people out to vote. Uh, we create two tiers. We create a superdelegate tier and then a, a, uh, a general tier that allows the workers at the uh, campaign polls in order to uh, make that happen. So uh, there's a lot of that going on uh, in order to get more people under the tent in the uh, Democratic Party. Uh, superdelegates, Republicans do not have superdelegates. It's just the Democrats that have that. Now, the cost of uh, House races and Senate races, remember, they are expensive. you got to get on television. Uh, a, Senate rate can, or a Senate race can cost you millions of dollars in order to get that race to run. A House race, still expensive, uh, but you can do it especially if it's more of a grassroots campaign. It's still possible to do it, but still money makes the world go around and uh, is definitely needed to get on television, to get on the radio, to air ads, uh, especially to counter other viewpoints, especially if, if a ca campaign goes negative. Um, that's a real problem if you're not on the air to rebut or refute those issues. Uh, and that uh, makes it really tough. Now, front-loading is the idea of races go earlier and earlier, closer and closer to the... Um the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primaries. Uh, we saw Nevada do that. We saw uh, South Carolina move theirs up. And I would venture to say each uh, each presidential election will continue to see those races continue to push further and further closer, if uh, not uh, uh, up beyond where Iowa is after uh, the debacle in Iowa this year. Uh, I would be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if if um, the Democratic and, and Republican parties decide to mix that up a bit. And especially uh, the fact that they're just not very diverse. Uh, they're not really a mix or representation of the parties uh, today. That's going to be a really tough angle uh, to um, to argue why they should still continue to go first after the debacles and the, the mess that uh, that happened in Iowa with the, uh, with the app that didn't work correctly. And then um, primary versus general. Don't forget a primary is uh, what's usually held in the um, between January and, and July, um, the, uh, the races uh, within the parties, uh, state by state, to determine who their primary, or excuse me, who their general election candidate is going to be. Uh, the general election is going to be then that candidate who won the primary runs against the other party uh, and the other party's candidates in the general election. Uh, so very different in terms of who's targeted there, which is uh, why we spell it out here. And then um, some review concepts to talk about. Uh, many of these we're going to address in much more detail in this chapter, which I think you'll find helpful. Uh, but we look at the FEC, the Federal Election Commission. We'll look at Buckley v. Vallejo, the idea that you can use your own money in campaigns. FECA, the result of the FEC, uh, basically uh, creating political action committees and limiting the amount of money that um, that candidate uh, that people can spend to donate to a candidate. BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which is basically going to limit the uh, the role of, of corporations and unions and also um, create uh, uh, ban soft money but create a funnel for soft money to go to outside groups, what we now know as 527s that we see here, uh, the idea of issues-oriented campaigns that are separate from the campaigns and the candidates themselves. Uh, this would be overturned in Citizens United, basically ruling that campaign and unions are people too, uh, and that they can spend unlimited amounts of money without limits, um, as we saw there uh, in BCRA. Now, they're going to hold that um, there's other parts of BCRA, such as banning soft money by political parties, uh, that does withstand uh, this, the constitutional scrutiny, uh, but, the, but the aspect of corporations and unions not having the freedom of speech to spend their money the way they see fit uh, is definitely an issue that the court said in this 5-4 to four ruling uh, that is 
is that is uh, highly unconstitutional. Now, independent expenditures, you got to understand, is is independent of the candidate, independent of the party. Uh, they are spending independently. They are running essentially shadow campaigns and super PACs and 527s are the areas that we see that happen. We also see that with 501c4s, and we'll talk about that in much greater detail in this chapter. And then the last one here, the the PAC uh, as well as the super PAC, political action committees can be affiliated they can be affiliated with a candidate uh, many candidates have their own packs uh, sometimes multiple packs because it's another way for people to donate to uh, the candidate uh, by doing it through their political action committees uh, and so because you can donate up to five thousand dollars there where in uh, donating directly to a candidate you'd be limited to the twenty eight hundred dollar rule and we'll get into a lot more of that detail here in a moment. But let's start with the Electoral College. And again, that, that uh, YouTube video on five things you need to know about the Electoral College is a great primer on, um, on all things uh, Electoral College. Uh, but uh, the, the basics, nuts and, the nuts and bolts of what you need to know, there are 538 electoral votes in the Electoral College. Um, it is not a college you can go to uh, unless you are an elector, uh, so don't think you're going to apply there for college, ha ha, lol. Uh, but no, it's uh, made up of the 100 senators that we see in the 50 states. It's also made up of each individual House member in the 50 states, and it's also made up of um, three electoral votes for the District of Columbia. So we have 435 members of the House, we have 100 senators, and we have three votes in the District of Columbia, one for a House seat, two for Senate seats, and that's where you get the magic number of uh, 538. 435 plus 100 in the Senate, that's 535, and then add 3 for D.C., that's 538. So uh, what you need to do in order to win is to win one more than half. If you divide it 538 in half, you get 269. You need one more than half, and that's the magic number of 270. So who he who gets he or she who gets 270 electoral votes will win the presidential election and then uh, be declared the winner. If there isn't a winner, according to Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, uh, the House of Representatives would get to vote for president, one vote per state, uh, which would be very interesting right now because if we did see an election that came down to 269, 269, uh, going to the House of Representatives, uh, which is a Democratic House, uh, but but only one vote per state means uh, the majority of those states actually are Republican, not Democratic. So we would probably end up with a Democrat uh, with a Republican uh, president president and um, not a democratic one, which is kind of interesting in terms of how that all breaks down. Uh, one other thing to note here, uh, the Senate would then choose the vice president per the Constitution. If the House chooses the president, the Senate would choose the vice president there. Now, can you win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College? Yes, you can. Uh, and we've had several uh, throughout the years that have done this. Uh, two in the last 20 years that have done this. This was the, was the 2000 election uh, where Bush ran against Al Gore. And the 2016 election where Donald Trump ran against Hillary Clinton. Um, Al Gore and Hillary Clinton both won the popular vote and lost the Electoral College. And as we know, the only thing that matters uh, in the presidential election is the Electoral College. And as you can see here, Hillary Clinton won 65 million votes uh, but lost the Electoral College. And that's all that matters in the end. Al Gore did the same. Uh, beating out uh, President uh, Bush, what would be President-elect Bush, by about 500,000 votes, and uh, but lost Florida and ultimately the Electoral College. Now, Hillary Clinton won by almost uh, just under, under 3 million additional votes, but again, lost the Electoral College, and that's all that matters. So um, it's, it's a tough... Uh, Pyrrhic victory uh, to, to win the battle but lose the war. Um, so uh, we've heard lots of calls for reforms. One of them is let's just directly uh, do the popular election type of thing. Uh, that would need two-thirds of Congress and three-fourths of state legislatures because you'd have to amend the Constitution. But there is a lot of uh, support for that from time to time. Haven't seen anything introduced in the House of Representatives, which is where it would need to start. Haven't seen that as yet, for everyone who's talking about it, no one seems to be jumping on that bandwagon. So uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, the one that has gained some steam is the national popular vote, or what, this, what they call the, uh, the interstate compact idea. This is uh, that the states would choose uh, to abide by the national popular vote 
if there were enough states to swing the Electoral College. Uh, and we're getting closer, uh, but not quite there just yet um, in terms of the number of votes uh, that are out there. And I think they are over 200 now in terms of uh, the number of Electoral votes that uh, states have, have pledged would go to the Electoral College but they're not at that magic number 270, which is where that would kick in. And might I add, if that were to kick in, I'm sure there would be some type of, of um, uh, lawsuit or some type of uh, uh, a suit in the courts to try and challenge its constitutionality um, and to be continued whether that would be seen as, as uh, fair enough or not. Now, proportional voting is another possible reform, and this is uh, what Nebraska and Maine do. They're the only two states that don't have uh, winner-take-all. In their states, uh, the, um, the, the winner of the actual state votes wins the two Senate seats, uh, but the winner of each district would win the district seats. And in 2008, President Obama won uh, the uh, one district in Omaha, Nebraska, and won that seat while, um, while uh, John McCain won the rest of the state. Um, and it's kind of interesting, but um, because uh, the idea is if proportional voting had been held in 2008 across all 50 states, Obama still would have been elected, but he wouldn't have been in 2012 if proportional voting had been used in all 50 states. Now, kind of interesting, in the 2016 election, we saw that President Trump actually won one of the districts in Maine, uh, but Hillary Clinton won all of the others. So it does show you how proportional voting does and can make an impact if the entire state doesn't necessarily all go for uh, winner take all. Now, um, I mentioned earlier with the idea of safe seats that House elections aren't very close, and this is indicative of it. Uh, we see uh, safe seats uh, throughout, for the most part, uh, versus competitive seats. Then The number is very small. Remember, 435 seats, and if there's 100 seats that are competitive, that's a lot. We saw that in 2010, but since then, we've seen the number dwindle, uh, definitely under 100. In 2012, we saw 99 competitive seats. In 2014, there were 85. In 2016, there were only 36, uh, surprisingly enough. And in 2018, that number went back up to about 82. Now, what uh, will happen in 2020, who knows? Uh, but um, we, we see some competitive seats there. Um, but, uh, but it all depends on uh, the president and the president's coattails in terms of uh, how that race plays out. Now, uh, remember I, I said incumbency advantage matters. Having a safe seat and being drawn to it uh, will tell you um, midterm elections, presidents usually lose those seats. Um, uh, gerrymandering has definitely helped uh, to create those safe seats in terms of uh, pushing a district in one way or another. But the idea there is... Uh, that uh, those safe seats definitely are safer as a result of gerrymandering as of what we see there. Now, uh, in terms of the presidential election, just a timeline uh, for us to go on here, we see that the presidential election season is usually somewhere between January and May. Now, with coronavirus, that's kind of getting pushed to June um, uh, with a couple of states like Louisiana that want to go a little later. Um, but uh, we usually see the primary election season start with the Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary. You you can see how that plays out here, leading to um, kind of a playoffs approach of uh, candidates competing against each other within the party, within the party. Then we get to the conventions in July and August, the Democrats usually in July, the Republicans in August, and this is where they announce their candidate, they announce their VP, uh, so they now have a ticket per the 12th Amendment, and then they can continue, they can uh, start their run, usually it's a road tour or a bus tour uh, where they're on the road going to different states usually battleground states or swing states, uh, the ones that uh, that uh, matter the most because they're trying to win them over, uh, and they'll go through those uh, usually for a week or two, and then it's back to hitting the road uh, for the uh, uh, flying around for the big uh, swing states and trying to uh, win over voters or collect money uh, and and hold fundraisers, that kind of thing. And then we get into uh, late August, usually uh, by, by September, by Labor Day, people are starting to start paying attention to the uh, general election, uh, and that leads us into uh, debates that will be happening, uh, that will be happening over the course of, of those couple of months, and then uh, that leads us into the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, which is our general election day. And 
then um, usually a vice presidential debate will have taken place. Maybe three presidential debates uh, have taken place, and then we we vote. Uh, and we do not con- conduct elections nationally. We conduct elections state by state by state. So remember the importance there that it is states that elect uh, a president, and it's that state by state electoral college winner take all that elects these individuals uh, because state elections are what matter, uh, and that um, is kind of how the uh, the campaign takes form. Now, a timeline of some campaign finance reform uh, found this on um, on the internet. I thought this was pretty good. I think some students put this together, so give them hats a uh, hat tip to them uh, in terms of some things here. But I thought uh, I would uh, kind of take you through some of the the highlights of campaign finance reform as we frame it around FICA which was created in 1971. Now, don't forget, um, so we know that there's you know all kinds of things happening in politics at this time, uh, but then we get Watergate and the idea of, of the election of 1972, and we see how all kinds of money is, is being played. Um, we've got Buckley v. Vallejo, which basically says, hey, if, you have, uh, uh, if you're rich and you have unlimited amounts of money, you're running for office, you want to spend the money, court says you can do that. Um, and uh, at, at, at this time, though, uh, people are collecting hard dollars. They're, they're um, finding ways to collect money. And uh, FICA basically is going to um, take a look at creating uh, the FEC, which, which uh, re- resulted in this Federal Election Campaign Act, uh, basically says, hey, we can, you can create a political action committee to raise more money. But again, it's limited donations in scope. Uh, and you can use it to raise awareness and, and advocate for and against your candidate. But the dollars are limited. Uh, it's hard money. And the dollars are limited in nature in terms of what you can collect. Um, now, PACs in, in this capacity can raise money within the legal limits. I mentioned $5,000 per election. So you can raise 5000 in the primary. You can raise another 5000 in the general. And if you look at the PACs here, that what we see, Honeywell International is a PAC. Um, many of the these are either unions or corporations that are raising money um, that can't be limited in nature in terms of how they're spending it. But the but the idea behind it is um, they can be affiliated with a candidate, uh, and and that is different from a super PAC. That's different from a 527. That's different from a 501c4. Um, those raise unlimited amounts of money, but uh, they have uh, are they are separate from the campaigns as a whole. They are independent expenditures in terms of the money they raise and the money they spend um, is unlimited in scope, and it is uh, darker money than what we see here with PACs. Pack a lot of sun sunlight on these packs because they have to report to the FEC, they have to report to the IRS, and those uh, those donors are known quantities. Um, so very different in that respect. Now Buckley v. Vallejo, as I mentioned, said, "Hey, if you've got your own money, you want to you want to spend it. This is free speech, free speech on you. Uh, this is not a required case anymore, but it is important to note." that it is a case that basically said, hey, if you have your own money and you want to spend it, even if it means you lose, uh, you can spend that money. The court agreed, uh, and and that's okay. That's a part of your free speech rights. Uh, McCain Feingold would come along and say, hey, you can do that, but uh, we're going to ban soft money. We're not going to let PACs, uh, because basically what happened along the way was PACs were raising money, but political parties wanted to raise money too. And so they started creating these soft money contributions in which for every hard dollar, they could collect a certain amount of soft money uh, in it as well. And uh, the uh, senators McCain and uh, John McCain and Russ Feingold basically came along and passed this bipartisan campaign reform act uh, in 2002 that said, "Hey, uh, we're going to ban soft money. We're going to push it out uh, so that you, if you want to, you want to raise unlimited amounts of money, you have to do that outside of the campaign. You can't be coordinating with them. You can't be in collusion." Uh, with all of this money that that's basically impacting campaigns, so that's what created and, and gave birth to 527s, these issue-oriented campaigns. They had to be separate from the campaign, and we'll talk more about them in a minute. Um, but it basically said, "Hey, wait a minute, um, you you can still uh, raise unlimited amounts of money." Um, and you just can't be coordinating with the campaign in so doing it. Uh, and that um, and the uh, BCRA also banned uh, the um, 
the unlimited contributions of corporations and unions. Now, this would be later overturned in Citizens United in that case uh, because the, the court basically ruled in a 5-4 to four decision that corporations and unions are people too and they have free speech rights. But, uh, but for this time, for about eight years, it basically um, put a cap on, on how much uh, they were spending and limited those amounts. Now, in Citizens United, uh, they, did, they did some key things here. Uh, they didn't get rid of all of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, but they did uh, take out that, uh, in, that uh, unions and corporations aspect. They did uh, say, uh, putting a cap on individuals um, in terms of what they can donate to a campaign um, can be limited, just like uh, don't, what a corporation donates to a campaign. But if they want to donate outside and they want to have their own political uh, arms, their own um, political action committees that raise unlimited amounts of money, that's their free speech right to do so, just like an individual can create a super PAC and do that. Um, as long as they're not affiliated with the campaign. But to... Um, but to uh, basically limit affiliations with the campaign in terms of those contributions, uh, the court said that is constitutional. So uh, it, they didn't throw out all of BCRA. They uh, they kind of picked and, and, and made some choices there. But the idea was the same in that it gave birth to these super PACs that we see today. Now, 527s, uh, remember I said our issues advocacy. So uh, they are independent of the campaign. Uh, they're totally unaffiliated. But they can have a quite a message. Now, um, before Citizens United, uh, 527s could not advocate for or against a particular candidate. Today, we see more super PACs than 527s, but issues-oriented ads are still out there. Uh, can they advocate for or against? Uh, the Supreme Court has said they can um, because they're independent expenditures. So they can, like a super PAC, advocate for or against. But we see a lot more money going to the super PACs where they have a lot more freedom uh, today than, than these issues advocacy 527 groups, named after the, the Internal Revenue Code of 527, where they came from. Uh, and they are effective. Uh, why do people use negative campaigning? Well, they use it because it works. Uh, that's really the the uh, the mindset behind it. But it basically, uh, to sum it up on Citizens United, they basically said corporations have free speech rights, unions have free speech rights, they're protected under the First Amendment. As long as they're independent of the campaign, um, they have to do, uh, 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 divulge who their donors are. They have to disclose that information uh, to the SEC. Um, and, uh, and, and, but the idea is th they can't keep them from creating a super PAC outside a campaign that's totally independent and running that. And that essentially gave birth to the super PACs that we see today. And those super PACs, uh, raise hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in uh, federal elections. Uh, they are outside groups. Some of them are known. Some of them are not known. Um, they do have to file reports with the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, but many of them will uh, pay a fine and do it after the election so they don't have to tell who actually donated to their campaign. So you can go to opensecrets.org and you can see, uh, you can type in uh, a campaign and see who they've donated to or type in a group and see what kind of money is out there. But again, uh, this is limited in nature because it's very dark money, at least for now, uh, in a campaign because of the fact that there's only so much um, that uh, they have to file. Uh, a lot of times it's it's easier to collect the money in these super PACs, pay a fine to the FEC for missing deadlines, and then just do it after the election. And then nobody really cares. Nobody nobody pays as much attention to the fact that, you know, you had hundreds of millions of dollars being donated by by um, uh, corporations or by uh, big ticket donors to to your campaign from uh, from your your political party largesse um, and and as long as they're not affiliated with a candidate uh, this is perfectly legal to do in the United States now 501c4s is the darkest of the dark money these are um, nonprofit groups that are primarily um, for for issues oriented uh, resources and they're non-political the majority of the times so that's 50.1 percent is primarily non-political which means 49.9 percent can be political uh, they can raise unlimited amounts they never have to do to divulge that information to the FEC they only have to report it to the IRS so this is the darkest of the dark money this is stuff we never know who the people are that donate and these issues oriented campaigns uh, advocating for or against issues or, or candidates um, 
as long as uh, the 501c4 doesn't have it as their majority primary purpose, they can continue to raise this money, they can continue to spend this money, they can have significant impact in the campaign. And again, it's an independent expenditure. They are independent of the campaign completely. But this is where we see the biggest growth in elections today, because this is where the money is going. Uh, people are donating in large amounts. We don't know who they are. It's the darkest of the dark money that we see out there today. Now, in terms of contribution limits uh, for the elections that we have coming up and the elections, uh, the primaries that we've seen so far, individual contributions, this is the only magic number you really need to know, and that is $2,800 per election. Now, PACs, I mentioned 5000 but the uh, magic number of 2800 is what an individual can donate uh, to a, a, um, a candidate. Uh, to a candidate's committee. Um, the idea behind that and is that um, that is adjusted for inflation. Uh, and and under this, that is what you can write the check for. That's hard money uh, in terms of the donations that you see here. These are hard money donations. They can be traced. They can be tracked. They're reported to the Federal Election Commission. They're reported to the IRS. Uh, these are all... Um, uh, very traceable and trackable. You can follow the money in terms of making this happen. Now, the question is on a lot of these that you see here with super PACs, can you follow the money? Yes, eventually you can, but chances are it's probably after the election. How about 527s? Yes, again, same thing. You probably can follow them, but they're probably not going to divulge their donor lists until after the election. 501c4s, money's dark. You don't know who they are. You don't know who they're donating to. You don't know in what amounts. You don't know why. The darkest of the dark money. So we see very differently there. Corporations and unions can set up their own 527s. They can set up their own super PACs. Uh, they can even set up their own 501c4s as long as primarily it is uh, not political in nature. So um, this really changes the game. Um, and Citizens United really changed the game in terms of the money uh, and where the money went here. It really changed where the money, uh, in terms of these billion dollar campaigns that were going into hard money and 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 getting the money into the campaigns, we're not seeing it go there anymore. Uh, yes, they're raising money, and they they really pride themselves on on those small money contributions. But the money's going outside now. The money's going to super PACs. It's going to 527s, and it's definitely going to the 501c4s. And so we saw this in 2008. We saw this in 2012. Uh, even more so after Citizens United, we saw this in 2016. Uh, and we will see it again in 2020 for sure in terms of the money raised, the money that's spent. It's all coming. Uh, it's coming in, but it's uh, coming in outside groups uh, even more so than what we see in the campaigns themselves. And the contributions, you can see blue and red, how they're coming in from Democrats, they're coming in from Republicans, they're coming in from all over. Uh, and they're coming in from the Midwest, they're coming in from the Northeast, they're coming in from the the um, the east and the west. Uh, they're coming in uh, in large quantities, and they're donating to both parties. So we're seeing a lot of money in this in these campaigns, and they're having a huge impact on these races. Now, one other um, item of note that you uh, don't necessarily need to know this case, but you need to know the background just in terms of there used to be a cap on how many of those individual twenty-eight hundred dollar donations you could have um, for a while there. The uh, the idea was, uh, through BCRA, uh, the idea was that you had a cap on it in terms of how much you could donate uh, and how many you could donate to. So the donation cap was like 100000 and change. So that meant about uh, less than 50 candidates you could donate to. And McCutcheon sued the FEC and said, hey, if I want to donate more money uh, to these campaigns and, and I want to donate to everybody and I have the money to do so, why can't I do that? You're violating my free speech. Well, the Supreme Court agreed and they said it is a violation of your free speech. So they basically wiped out the cap on individual spending. So now if you have the resources and you want to donate $2,800, which is what it is now, to every candidate that's out there that's running, you have the ability to do that. You are not limited in terms of making that happen. So um, that's an important case because, again, the idea is money in the campaigns. Why is it that a lot of these presidential campaigns are trying to collect small dollar donors uh, to show how much their grassroots campaign and grassroots organization is growing? Um, that's really um, 
what they're what they're striving for is to get those people uh, to come out to vote and come out and write those checks, uh, even if it's uh, those small money donations. Hope you found this helpful. Um, a great chapter, lots of information. Uh, I would encourage you to also watch the highlights, uh, especially as you get ready for the quiz test or the AP exam. Uh, you'll find that helpful too. I know there's a lot of information chalked in here, which is why I really uh, wanted to do the uh, chapter notes on this one via YouTube. Uh, but definitely watch the top 12 highlights. I think you'll find it beneficial as well. Live the five, have a great day, and we will see you soon in the next chapter.